It's an honor to welcome to the Rector's Forum Dr. Harry Moore. Harry grew up on a small farm in Alabama. He has degrees in English from Auburn University, Rice University, and Middle Tennessee State University. And he taught for decades before retiring from Calhoun Community College in North Alabama, which happens to be the same school where my wife taught for a few years before moving to Memphis. Harry is a poet, and his poems have appeared in several journals, including the Distillery, Alabama Literary Review, the South Carolina Review, the Penwood Review, and what is the premier journal for Anglican theology in the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Theological Review. Harry has two books that he's published in his retirement, What He Would Call Them and Time's Fool. He is also the winner, and it's just recently discovered this, he's the winner of the 2014 Marine Egan Writers Exchange Award. And in winning this award, he joins a remarkable company with the likes of writers Sue Monk Kidd, the author of The Secret Life of Bees, if you've read that great novel, and many other important American authors. Harry lives in Decatur with his wife Cassandra, and they attend St. John's Episcopal Church, the church where I served for about nine years before coming to Grace St. Luke's, and where I was delighted to know them both as parishioners and as friends. Harry was my senior warden, like Antoinette Cheney, for a year, so they're huddling together at the table and sharing <laughs> stories and wisdom of what to do together. Um, we would be here a very, very long time if I told you about all of the ways in which Harry's wisdom, his subtlety, and above all, his humor have opened my eyes to the grace of God. He is a major, he continues to be a major influence on my life. And that's what he does as a poet. He opens our eyes to very ordinary things and people, people we see every day. But he manages to show us these things and people, even ourselves, in an extraordinary, even heavenly light. It's for this reason that I have given him the topic, the Episcopal Liturgy of Poets Day. Please welcome him to Grace St. Louis. Thank you, Rich. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. My wife Cassandra and I are delighted to be here at Grace St. Luke's today. Uh, we have tons of fond memories of uh, Richard, Catherine, Adeline, Evans. Richard, as I recall, was either 14 or 15 when he came as curate to St. John's. I remember being astonished that at such a tender age he had completed college and done seminary. Uh, he was with us for about nine years and uh, richly blessed us. Uh, I remember Catherine also from an academic setting uh, where she taught speech classes for us at a Calhoun Community College where I taught. I don't know if Thad Cockrell is here. There he is, Thad. Uh, Thad, Cassandra, and I have many fond memories together in the two-year College English Association Southeast. Uh, going back over uh, a number of years. I'm going to read some poems and suggest some connections to the liturgy and uh, steadily and steadfastly resist the teacher's urge to explain too much. Uh, <clears throat> but I will suggest some ideas, uh, things for us to look at as we look at these poems. Usually English teachers begin by looking at words, and if you take liturgy, uh, it is rooted in two different words, two Greek words, where the word meant public service to the gods. The L-I is from the same root that we get laity, people, and the U-R-G-Y is the Greek root for work. You still see it in physics, in the uh, ERG as a unit of expenditure of energy work. So the liturgy is the work of the people. Now we might emphasize people, it's all of us and not just the priest. And I think Richard would be happy with that and that, that's obviously true. But I also would like to emphasize work. 
Work is action, expenditure of energy. It's what we do. So worship for Episcopalians and for liturgical churches is not something that occurs in some only in some deep recesses of the mind, but it is somehow mixed in with standing and kneeling and saying and eating and drinking. It's a part of what we do. And the meaning of our faith is in those actions. We can't always abstract that. And that's what I would like for us to think of as one of the primary connections between poetry and liturgy. Poetry focuses on images, not just abstract ideas, but images. It gives us an experience. And five different people may bring away from the poem, from those images, their own variation filtered through their own experience. I think we do similar things uh, with the liturgy. Am I talking too loud? No. Try that. All right. Good. Okay. Good. I don't mind. Yeah, I, I can do this. This is good. Very good. <laughs> Speaking of symbols and uh, such things, I will refer uh, this morning a number of times to a book of poems by Mary Oliver Thirst. And uh, Mary Olive is a wonderful poet. She's won a Pulitzer Prize. She's won a National Book Award. She's over 80 now. And the last I knew, she lived on Cape Cod. Uh, and so a lot of the images are from there. This is a book about grief, uh, in part, for a person she loved very much for many years. Uh, it's also a book about faith in many ways. And if you're looking for maybe Advent reading, I would very much recommend Mary Oliver's Thirst. Poetry uh, is connected to the liturgy, first of all, uh, historically, through tradition. For many centuries through the Middle Ages, uh, in England and Europe and the Western world, the liturgical calendar was in many ways the calendar. And so naturally poems emerged that were hooked to certain seasons of the liturgical year. When the Reformation occurred and uh, the Anglican Church became different in the 16th century from the uh, Catholic Church of Europe, that tradition continued, and in the 17th century, at least two major English poets, John Donne and George Herbert, uh, were also priests, Anglican priests. And just to illustrate the connections between liturgy, the priesthood, and poetry, uh, I want to read with you that first poem in your handout. Obviously, it's connected to Easter. It's George Herbert's Easter Wings. Lord, who createdst man in wealth and store, though foolishly he lost the same, decaying more and more till he became most poor. With thee, O oh, let me rise as larks harmoniously and sing this day thy victories. Then shall the fall further the flight in me. My tender age in sorrow did begin, and still with sickness and shame thou didst so punish sin that I became most thin. With thee let me combine and feel this day thy victory. For if I imp my wing on thine, Affliction shall advance the flight in me. Imp is a falconry term, 
And so basically he's saying, hook me to the wing of the falcon when it's sent out. So in both stanzas, the first one generic man, humankind, everybody, the human race, and the second more personally, the, po uh, the poet I, in both cases, Herbert has the verse literally. He's celebrating this victory over sin so much that the poem actually narrows on the page until it becomes most thin. And then the next two words are with thee. Not that I by my effort will dig my way or fly my way or jump my way out of this, but with thee and then the verse grows. Uh, as he celebrates the victory over sin and death by the grace of God. And each stanza culminates with a bird image. The lark in the first stanza, the English lark, not that lowly fee lark, field lark that I grew up knowing in East Central Alabama, but the, the English lark soars either at dusk or dawn, and it sings as it soars. So it's a wonderful image of, of exuberance and joy and victory. So in, in this poem by George Herbert, you know, we have a link between the literary tradition, particularly poetry, and uh, the liturgical year. Many things changed between the early 1600s and the uh, early 1900s, three centuries. The breakup of, through the Reformation of the Unified Church, uh, the workings of science, a lot of skepticism. But one thing that interests me is that even in the more skeptical quarters, among the poets who aren't directly tied to the liturgical tradition, you will still find poems that are hooked to the liturgical seasons. On page two of your handout, one of these is by Thomas Hardy. Hardy, had, born in uh, 1840, had a career as a novelist uh, until he was to his, really in his mid-50s. And he got so put out because people found Jude the Obscure so dark in the uh, early 1890s that he quit fiction and in age, had a career as a poet. So he's writing in his old, older age, and uh, he is writing at the beginning of the 20th century. Despite his own skepticism, look at what he says uh, in The Oxen. Christmas Eve and 12 of the clock. Now they are all on their knees, an elder said, as we sat in a flock by the embers in hearthside ease. We pictured the meek, mild creatures where they dwelt in their strawy pen. Nor did it occur to one of us there to doubt they were kneeling then. So fair a fancy few would weave in these years. Yet I feel if someone said on Christmas Eve, Come, see the oxen kneel in the lonely barton by yonder comb our childhood used to know. I should go with him in the gloom, hoping it might be so. If you move to the end of the 20th century with the uh, Russian expatriate poet Joseph Brodsky, who, in spite of not really putting himself in the church in his poetry, still wrote a series of nativity poems. And uh, this is one I, I find uh, particularly apt and moving. Star of the Nativity. In the cold season, in a, locally, in a locality accustomed to heat more than to cold, to horizontality more than to a mountain. A child was born in a cave in order to save the world. 
It blew as only in deserts in winter it blows, athwart. To him all things seemed enormous, his mother's breast, the steam out of the ox's nostrils, Caspar, Balthazar, Melchior, the team of the Magi, their presence heaped by the door, ajar. He was but a dot, and a dot was the star. Keenly, without blinking, through pallid stray clouds, upon the child in the manger from far away, from the depth of the universe, from its opposite end, the star was looking into the cave. And that, and that was the father's stare. I think the poem pretty much speaks for itself. The, uh, by all sorts of worldly existential standards, you know, the insignificance of the scene, the manger scene, and yet putting it in a context uh, where that we see the theological significance of this event. So we could go back to the Middle Ages when in the King Arthur stories the writer says, well, during Pentecost or at Whitsuntide, White Sunday, Pentecost, so uh, when the candidates for baptism were so numerous and wore white, so often that they called Pentecost White Sunday, Whitsuntide. Or uh, it was at Michaelmas, September 29th, Feast of St. Michael. Or Sir Gawain and the Green Knight occurs at Christmas. So you get the liturgy woven into the poetry. And then after the Reformation with Herbert and others, still this consciousness of the liturgical year and even in the modern world, shot through with so much skepticism. And uh, show me this is true uh, with people like Hardy and Brodsky. You still get the link between poetry and liturgy. A second connection uh, between poetry and liturgy is that both are what I would call incarnational. It's hard to think about things we do without thinking, like breathing. You know, you could asphyxiate yourself if you started examining the way you breathed. You, know, you, you do it unconsciously. Language is that way. And we don't see what a miracle it is. That we can take uh, a sound, child, tree, jump, love, Hook it on to an object, a person, an action, a quality, and stow it and take it with us when we aren't even in the presence of those things. And basically, every child, when they hit, I don't know, soon after a year old, in their second year, they play the what's that game. They are naming their world. They are incarnating that world in their head and making an index of the universe. Adam, all the animals were brought to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. In focusing on actions and substances like water and bread and wine, the liturgy recognizes and preserves for us this incarnational connection with the world and all its meaning. Poets help to name our world, especially things we have not noticed. And in naming, they celebrate and praise. And in naming, they show us also how to meditate. I want to read a poem by uh, Mary Oliver. It's the title poem. No, it's not the title poem. I'm sorry. I was looking at the title of the book. It's from the book Thirst. It's on page three of your handout. She 
She thinks of herself as a messenger. My work is loving the world. Here the sunflowers, there the hummingbird, equal seekers of sweetness. Here the quickening yeast, there the blue plums. Here the clown deep in the speckled sand. Are my boots old? Is my coat torn? Am I no longer young and still not half perfect? Let me keep my mind on what matters, which is my work, which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. The Phoebe, the Delphinium, the sheep in the pasture, the pasture, which is mostly rejoicing since all the ingredients are there, or here, I'm sorry which is gratitude to be given a mind and a heart in these body clothes, a mouth with which to give shouts of joy to the moth and, and the wren, to the sleepy dug-up clam, telling them all over and over how it is that we live forever. One example in the liturgy that... Uh, it, I don't really know how mainstream it is in the Episcopal liturgy, but on Monday, Thursday, the washing of feet. I grew up in a, a very conservative uh, Protestant church, and we looked over at those we considered more primitive who practiced foot washing. Uh, and that was always a kind of abstract thing. Sure, Christ said, as I have washed your feet, so you ought also to wash one another's feet. Humility, well, that was the point. But humility is an abstraction. What happens when you incarnate humility? Uh, Richard has agreed to read a, a poem of mine. This is the poem that was published in the uh, uh, Anglican Theological uh, Review. Monday, Thursday. In the empty chancel, I kneel before my friend as she places bare feet into a basin of clear water. Rubbing each dripping foot with a clean towel, I think how this touch is more than peaceful hug, or handshake, and how dusty were the roads of Palestine. Once, when I was eight, my father bade me wash his feet with water drawn by hand from our deep well, then heated on the stove. Every day he walked behind a mule and horse, and still being plowed, turning sandy soil hour by hour, an acre a day. Then with hogs fed, cows milked, supper dishes put away, he sat and moving in the rocking chair. I watched him loose the leather strings of high top shoes, peel off the dusty socks, roll denim cuffs to slender calf, and sink his feet in the warm and soapy mix. My brother read a book, my mother worked her mill job miles away, and the radio bore sounds of Johnny Dollar and Mr. and Mrs. North. As my fingers pressed his foot, rubbed ankle and toes, he leaned back and the day's soil swirled in the warm water. We do not draw our water now. It comes already hot, and no one walks behind the plow. But kneeling barefoot in the choirless chancel brings back a night when my father sat in weariness and let me, a child, wash his feet. A third way, in addition to the historical connection and the incarnational connection between us and our world, that the liturgy and poetry connect, is similar to the incarnation point, but it goes beyond that. Both are, I think, sacramental. That is, they locate the meaning of things in the things. The actions, the objects, we don't experience, we aren't angels. We aren't ethereal beings. 
We are bodies and spirits. There are those, of course, in the Christian tradition, plenty of them, who will tell you quickly that you can extract the meaning and line it up in four points or six points or nine or 13, whatever group you're dealing with, and hand it to you. And if you don't buy all of them, you will burn. But I think it's wonderful that as Episcopalians, we are attuned and have, we are schooled by the liturgy to be attuned to mysteries we cannot extract and to access grace and experience grace and know those mysteries even though we may not be able to put into words what just happened as we leave the altar or as we rise from a certain prayer. To those who would do the extraction thing and say the steak and the pasta don't matter but you know, I'll get you a little glass of nutrition over here. And that'll be it. Uh, the poem on page five at the top of the page, uh, Emily Dickinson will, uh, is really my answer to that. Emily Dickinson was an astonishing genius. She rarely left Amherst, Massachusetts, lived her life in the house she was born in, died in her mid-50s of uh, complications from Bright's disease. But when the people went into her room, she was very reclusive, but when they went into her room after she died, they found something over 1,700 poems sewn together in little uh, booklets that scholars choose to call fascicles. And in, uh, a man named Thomas Johnson edited these, maybe in the 1930s, in what has become the authorized, sort of the standard uh, edition of Emily Dickinson's works. But how she, living in that, with that limited vantage point, understood so many astonishing things about the universe and life, it, it is a a tribute to the human imagination and the human spirit. Reminding us here that if we ever get at the truth, it will be indirectly. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Circuit is going around. Too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. I would suggest that over time, over the centuries and the church as a whole and over our lifetime as we practice the liturgy, the truth does dazzle gradually. And we take it in, not always through our conscious mind cognitively, but we take it in. We are approaching uh, the season of Advent, the beginning of the liturgical year, and I want to uh, offer a, a couple of poems to give you a kind of a poet's angle on Advent. What I'm suggesting is that in a poet's approach to the images of the poem and the objects, uh, the discovery of meaning, the making of connections in the poem is essentially the same thing we do in the liturgy, in the connections we make in, our, in what we do in the liturgy. Now in the liturgy, we have repeated over time experiences, a structure, even if we are in a season of dryness in our spirit, even if we're just baffled by what we see on the news, our spirits are nourished through this repetitive experience of grace. Poets go out and attempt, they do it for themselves, to make the connections 
uh, spontaneously and in, in an exploratory way, if we take this same approach to the other realities we meet, how might what we see every day yield up meaning and grace to us? I want to invert the order of these. I'm going to read my poem on page six first. And the whole point of that is to have climactic order so that when you read Mary Oliver's poem, you won't see such a falling off when you get to mine. <laughs> I'm protecting myself. <clears throat> Advent. In our backyard bed, a scraggly mum blooms one last fling white petals angling toward a distant sun. Pentas linger fading red, and one defiant dandelion bursts in brilliant yellow. Monkey grass hangs bitten, limp, and twisted leaves litter the brittle zoysia. Beside a leaning amaryllis blade, the sign our daughter gave us begs in metal letters, grow. And on the tool shed roof, jasmine clings to concrete shingles, 80 winters old. A neighbor's tall magnolia drops windfall seed pods on St. Francis, spattered brown from summer's rain. No birds haunt the dry and rusted bath. Across the way, a giant bear pecan scrawls itself across the sky, its tangled branches like chaotic capillaries from some hidden heart. We wrap ourselves in faith that all this death is but a sleep, that squirrel scratching in our attic will emerge with young. And in the spring, crepe myrtles blossom pink and white beside the garbage bins. And in our bones, we nurse a wordless trust that the cold season is but cipher for our deeper self. The hungry spirit, reft of grudges, guilt, fancies, gaudy trim, with nothing but itself to give, and no way to begin, a thousand generous deeds waiting to be born. I love what Mary Oliver does in her volume Thirst, uh, so candid about her grief and with what faltering steps she tries to walk a path of faith uh, and still finding joy, uh, things to celebrate, and faith in the details of her life. It's wonderful in this poem, making, ready, making the house ready for the Lord, which clearly is what we try to do in Advent, prepare for the nativity. Uh, how she uses such an offhand tone to suggest something so profound. Dear Lord, I have swept and I have washed, but still nothing is as shining as it should be for you. Under the sink, for example, is an uproar of mice. It is the season of their many children. What shall I do? And under the eaves and through the walls, the squirrels have gnawed their ragged entrances. But it is the season when they need shelter. So what shall I do? And the raccoon limps into the kitchen and opens the cupboard while the dog snores, the cat hugs the pillow. What shall I do? Beautiful is the new snow falling in the yard and the fox who is staring boldly up the path to the door. And still I believe you will come, Lord. 
You will, when I speak to the fox, the sparrow, the lost dog, the shivering sea goose, know that really I am speaking to you whenever I say, as I do all morning and afternoon, come in, come in. For me, and ultimately that's all we can say, speak for ourselves, poetry and the liturgy remind us that we traffic in all of our attempts at communication in a language of metaphors. We live in a wonderful mystery. that is full of joy and wonder, the creation, and also full of difficult and even horrible things. Our liturgy helps us to shape and sustain our faith and to guide us through it. We have no way of talking about God except through metaphors, either that the tradition, the theological tradition, the liturgical tradition uh, gives us. Actually, we have no way of talking except in metaphors. We are always choosing a sound or some letters that represent a sound to stand for something else that we think we see, common objects or spiritual insights. And so in theology, as well as in poetry and in our liturgy, we traffic in metaphors. And the wonderful thing is, for me, that the Episcopal tradition and the Episcopal liturgy acknowledges that and sustains that and preserves that so that we can sustain ourselves and live in the mystery and know the joy and endure, if need be, those terrible things that happen. Knowing, as uh, Mary Oliver says, not all of you can say, you're old, of course. But I can join her in saying, you know, look, I've gotten to this point and no longer perfect. But still, come in, come in. Thank you. I'll be happy to uh, answer questions if, you, if you're not totally befuddled. <laughs> uh, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. Usually if you don't ask them, my wife will ask me something hard. So, uh, <laughs> Hi. Oh, yes, yes. I think writing portrait must be very, very difficult and very deeply emotional and spiritual, too. Uh, where do you write? What do, I, I may have missed this in the introduction because mm -hmm. I came in late, but do you have a particular time and pattern of writing? Yeah, that was always my question. <laughs> uh, I started uh, only a little over 20 years ago, seriously. I'd scribbled into a journal uh, yeah, before sort of bled into my journal for therapy. Uh, but I started trying to shape things and get them published a little over 20 years ago was awfully slow, and I was working full time and had other responsibilities. And, but I would, one or two a year, I would get placed in a journal and built a little collection. Retirement has been wonderful. Uh, I retired at the beginning of 2009, in mid-academic time, January 2009. Uh, my wife worked on for three years, and so she would leave in the morning, and, uh, and I would go to my study. I have that sort of typical man's cave uh, where I write. I walk morning, that may be with the dog, often is, it may be without the dog, and walking stimulates me. And, and really it's a kind of meditation, observing and walking. And you know, it, it's like anything else. You know, you don't always feel what you want to feel. The ideas may not come, but I get most of my ideas in the morning and get them drafted, and then I can come back and work on it. Uh, later, but 
Uh, I do have a place that works best for me, and it, it's in that sort of uh, not too neat study. Uh, mm -hmm. that. <laughs> Other questions for here? That, that, that I'm going to be the I'm probably going to be when I'm a teacher. Gary <laughs> <laughs> uh, pointed out that, um, that the liturgical calendar and the liturgy <coughs> were this sort of organic thing that formed a culture. You, you, you can see that in all of the, the uh, British literature and, and the American literature where you have passages from the Book of Common Prayer and passages from the Bible that are titles of works. Um, and even you know, in, in those two traditions, you have good examples of people who grew up with that, who left it, you know, who are completely uh, non-believers now, but who still are comfortable with the language and the images and stuff from the church. I wonder if you have any feel for, you know, in, in our increasingly non-religious culture for what is going to take the place of the, the institution of the church uh, as a formative influence on, you know, a common, this is, I don't mean for this to be a difficult question, <laughs> of course not. common literature, you know, American literature, whether you think it's going to be you know, the internet or is it going to be uh, environmentalism or I mean, give me a deal for that. Well, that's a wonderful question, Thad, and I, I basically have no idea. Uh, but uh, I can always make up uh, that's what something. I yeah. Uh, I think on every hand, uh, you know, uh, we, we complained over the years. Our kids didn't would come in. We were in the Bible Belt in the South. You make some reference to Cain or Delilah or some Lazarus. You know, you get blank stares. Uh, our shopping, you know, instead of home stores and Sears and what we're used to, you know, you have these standardized stores and malls. You could be in Los Angeles or Tallahassee, uh, basically. Uh, so in all sorts of ways, I think, and, and, and kids are, or people are dealing so much in a virtual world. And I see articles about raising questions about what is this doing to, to our brain. Uh, I don't despair. I don't know what shape, you know, less and less pervasively, you know, where we have the language of the prayer book, the language of the Bible, the language of the church as a unifying factor. I, th I think that clearly is true. That's been sort of decaying for, for some time. I do think that the uh, culture making mind is still there and our kids maybe even our grown kids have a network of allusions you know video games and things like that that they spin off of so I, I have to have faith in the uh, the metaphor making mind but I, I think it's a good thing that we you know we pull back and look at this for example so many kids, you know, they, they experience the world virtually and just going outside and looking at a tree and listening to a bird. You know, that, what, would, what would that volume by Mary Oliver be? You know, if she didn't have those images from Cape Cod as vehicles, you know, for what she wants to say. Uh, I'm really repeating your question. I, I, do, I would say, though, that I, I, I do have faith in, in a religious sense, I have faith in the Episcopal tradition that gives us room to, to move and adapt to new circumstances and maintain the faith in some of the language changes. But still there's the, the tradition. Uh, and, and more broadly, uh, you just have to have some faith in the way the human mind works and its metaphors that other, these tentacles of connections will be made for the generation coming on. That is good enough. Other questions for Harry? Uh -oh. Cassandra, I'm going to beat you to it. Since you live with him, I'm going to take this one. Um, <laughs> Y'all have a long car ride home to, to, to Cater, Alabama. Um, one of my the Book of Common Prayer, liturgy is, is all about all the things we hold in common, bread, wine, oil, 
passing the bees. What I love about your, your poets today and the poems you looked at, it shows us the other side of what we hold in common, which is the part that is so personal and intense and even private, um, sometimes ambiguous. Say a little bit about, about that, and maybe it's a question about how what liturgy does is it, is it holds together the objective and the subjective, and to have one without the other, something's missing. Yeah, uh, if we're talking about the, uh, you know, the public common, and then the poet, and writing is a lonely occupation. Uh, I mean, you have to retreat, pull back in order to write about anything. But you're interacting with the world. I like to think of it, if I dig deep enough down in my psyche, and into my mind, and I find these connections. Paradoxically, if I dig deeply enough into my own experience, I find like a water table down there that we share, and you're drinking of that same well. A common ground down there that we all uh, stand on. And that's the paradox of poetry, I think. If, if, if the question is individual and, and, and public and common. Now, poets, some poets retreat into a symbolism that is so private uh, that, it, that it's really hard to operate. And there's always that question of, is this thing that has meaning for me uh, going to, or others going to get this? Uh, I also think we bring from that public experience of the liturgy a, a way of experiencing the world, of seeing the... Uh, the, the meaning, the subjective in the objective. Of the object, uh, Coleridge says the idling spirit always seeks echo or mirror of itself. And I think we're, we're repeatedly, all language does this, I'm mad as fire. I'm so angry I feel hot as that fire. Uh, she gave me the cold shoulder. Well, you know, she gave me an indifference that is like a cold shoulder. So language itself helps us with that. But I think uh, the liturgy feeds this way of responding uh, to the world. And paradoxically, the insights of the poet, if they're good and if they work, do pull us, pull us together. Thank you, Gary. Okay, Cassandra, you get the last question. Well, that is just not really a question. I'm just terrified. And Monday, Thursday. The first time we did that at St. John's was Richard. Yes, yes. Uh, Richard, in the last, toward the end of his nine years with us at St. John's, said, well, you know, we're going to wash feet. This is optional. Yeah. And, uh, but we're going to wash feet on Monday, Thursday. And as I said, this had always been a kind of abstract concept with me that I associated with groups we call primitive. Even though the group I grew up in was really heavy on doing the commandments exactly the way they said. And Christ had said fairly unambiguously, if I have washed your feet, then ought you also to wash one another's feet. We wanted to abstract the humility. Oh, clearly, he was just talking about being humble, and I am humble. <laughs> but in, we always gained, we pitched in, and, and it, it was... Not just for the connection with my father, that was sort of an offshoot as I thought about it later, but our feet are very sensitive. And no, we don't always want everybody to see our feet and to be that vulnerable and to touch one another's feet. And Richard was very sanitary with all this. Everybody got a clean towel. <laughs> but it was a moving experience. I knew what humility meant when I walked away from that barefooted in front of everybody with my cuffs rolled up. Having had my feet washed and having washed the feet of a friend, you know, whose hand I shook at the passing of the peace over and over. But this was different. Yeah, we, we owe that to Richard. <laughs> Actually, in one sense, it's, if you don't know it to me, I'll, I'll remember, you know, change is hard, obviously, in churches, in any church. I remember when we brought in foot washing, 
Kurt Washington came into the Episcopal Church in the, 19, in the late 1970s with the Holy Week rites in the current prayer book, 1979. And St. John's, for whatever reason, had just never done all of the Holy Week rites. And so we started with uh, Monday Thursday. You've done it for a long, long time. So it's not a new tradition for us here. And I remember there was someone who will go nameless who, who was just so upset with me about this, this foot washing, what this meant. And I tried to show her the prayer book, and, all this, and she's, she's finally said, I, I am so mad at you. And I responded in a response that was true, but perhaps uncharitable. I said, well, you really should be mad at Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't go well. <laughs> but it did. Um, it's funny, you know, you think about when you're a priest in a place for a long time, and then when you leave, this was my first experience of leaving a parish to come to all of you, it, it's a very humbling and, and, and difficult, and, and especially when you look back over nine years and you think about you know, what you did that was lasting versus what you did that, that was not lasting and things like that. And it, honestly, it was one of the most moving things in my life when Harry sent me that Monday, Thursday um, poem. I, Harry, it is absolutely stunning and, and I've read it um, multiple times and it still brings tears to my eyes and just thank you for that God bless your poetry congratulations on all your awards and accolades and I cannot tell you how grateful I am that you and Cassandra joined us this morning